Well, if we take the DUP at its word, the talks are over for the foreseeable future. And at the Belfast City Council meeting this week, Chris McGimsey warned Sinn Féin about what he said was weaponising the Irish language. People who are interested in the Irish language need to waken up. They need to realise they do have friends in the unionist community. But constantly attacking us, constantly weaponising the, the language and using the language just as another opportunity to poke the prods in the eye is not the way forward. You know, Chris McGimsey, let's start with you. Poking the prods in the eye. Can we get, should we not be getting rid of this language? And should we not be understanding that nationalists have rights to and, and maybe they deserve those rights beyond you accusing them of poking prods in the eye. How is that helpful? Well, there's two points. First of all, was I right to say that? Yes, I think that's a good way of describing it because that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're always trying, trying with the Irish Language Act, to try and uh, infuriate the Protestant unionist community, and, and that's not right. The second point you're, 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 you were saying about there is, is with regard to the Irish, uh, Irish language itself and the Irish speakers. I mean... Robin's, the very first speech Robin Swan gave as leader of the, of, of the, of the Unionist Party was to say we, 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 che- we, we welcome and support all those who cherish the Irish language. There's no problem with the Irish language. Four and a half thousand people learn it in, 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 in the Belfast area, and, but they have got the rights that they acquire. This Irish Language Act is, is purely a, being used by them as a stick to beat us with. And, and well, that's damaging. But if that's that's your- if that is, and, and by the way, just to make clear tonight, so we, we've done the debate, right, about uh, the for and against an Irish Language Act and all that. That's not what we're doing tonight. What I'm trying to understand tonight is why is there not a lot of flexibility within <coughs> loyalism around this? What, what, are they so, what are they so terrified of? Because what was in the draft agreement that, that we saw... Or if it wasn't a draft document, a a draft agreement, it was a draft document, or it was Donald Duck, or whatever it was, it was a piece of paper that there was Irish language proposals in. Why does it terrify people like you, Jimmy Bryson? Well, it doesn't terrify me at all. And and the point is this. The Irish Language Act has been weaponised in the sense that it's been used to hold unionism hostage. They are demanding... Well, we can't have a government unless we accede to an Irish Language Act. It is the politics of hostage. And when you pay the politics of hostage once, then Sinn Féin will be back next year. But it wants you to look under the skin of that. Hold on. Don't tell me to hold on. uh, First of all, I'll tell you when to hold on, right? So when, when, when you're looking under the skin of that, what it actually means, what was there, not the speculation, what was there in that draft document that would have been so shockingly unacceptable Loyalists. You see, this is, it's not where these things start, it's where they end. And where was this going to end? Well, we know where this is going to end because on Monday the 12th of February, on your show, I asked the Irish language lobby, would you want street signage enforced in unionist areas such as the Shankill and East Belfast? And they said yes. yes and it was at that, it, it was at that moment. Well, document. But Stephen, this is where these things start. It's where they end. No, but they the will point, never be happy. But they jo- will never be happy. But Jimmy, the point is it wasn't in the document. So what I'm saying to you is, what was there well, in the let document me give you, let me give that you was so exa- unacceptable the, the, to lawyers? There was a proposal for a commissioner in the document. So a, a commissioner who was going to end up uh, rapidly expanding the rights of Irish uh, within the civil service is going to enforce uh, Irish speaking uh, in, in numerous public bodies. Sinn Féin as, have already as, said as, there as, would not be quotas. Oh, oh, so we're going to take Sinn Féin's word on it now? We're going to take Sinn Féin's word? Are you, are you serious? You want, you want the unionists to take Sinn Féin's word? Ben, were there quotas in that document? No, there weren't. But this is the problem. We're talking about the document as if it's reasonable, which it is compared to the extreme um, things that were proposed. So what Sinn Féin have done is quite incredible. 13 months ago, they bring down the government. Nobody else does this. Nobody else thinks that they would get away with it. And then we hear nothing. It's not as if they're tr- they show any evidence of trying to bring people along with them. We have Irish language activists confirming the worst fears about quotas. And then 
when that doesn't appear in the document, we're meant to be thankful. I mean, it is a textbook way of how not to go about this. This is why, amongst our readers, in the whole spectrum from Jamie to Chris, there's concern about what's happening and what they've done with the language. Well, what I'm trying to establish tonight is, is the concern warranted? Is the concern legitimate or is the concern whipped up? There was a senior person within Sinn Féin saying to me today, he was having to go at me, right? That's, that's a daily occurrence from Sinn Féin, DUP, pick a politician, that's what they do. But, but they were saying to me today that Sinn Féin made it clear last year that there would not be quotas within the civil service, that that's not what they were about. I think that the quotas thing has come and gone from 2015 when Carolyn McKeelan um, mentioned it. But what it's actually done is people are now thinking about, you mean it's possible that sometime in the future there might be quotas? So I would say that you can't even now have audits of the public sector. We mustn't go down any route that possibly even in the future leads to quotas, that possibly even in the future leads to compulsory Irish in schools. And that's the situation they've created by taking that stance. It's a politics of hostage. You know, we, we must pay the place. We must have an Irish Language Act, or else we can't have a government. Or is it's it the, the politics it's, of compromise? No, no, no. Oh, the politics of compromise. So tell me this. Imagine for one moment unionism collapsed the assembly and said, OK, until we can have a pleading act that allows us to march down whatever street we want, whenever we want, there will be no government. Could you imagine the chaos? But yet we all have to sit and accede to Sinn Féin's list of demands. And well, then but be, but be, be what we're thankful. having here is a conversation, not about what was asked, because what we're having here is, OK, these things were asked for and they appear to be quite reasonable, but we can't agree to those because they might ask for something unreasonable. And if we did that, we'd never legislate for anything, because if we ask for this, oh, they'll want that. I mean, it, it really is well, a nonsense let's, let's here, because we're not talking about reality anymore. A bit of paper that said... Can we have this, that and the other? And say, go, oh, yeah, they seem reasonable. Don't give them it, because they might end up asking for something unreasonable. Why is it even an issue? We had a historic compromise 20 years ago where unionism gave up its democratic right in order to share power. And part of that agreement gave generous provision for all minority languages, not just Irish, but all minority languages, and bear in mind, there are more, more families, probably 10 times the families sitting in Northern Ireland speaking Chinese than are speaking well, Irish David, today. We're having, we're, having, we're having a debate that I'm not here to have tonight. What I'm, what, what I'm here to ask you all tonight but is what would... But unionism hasn't been what, generous to the Irish what, language. What would Unionist be acceptable talks. in terms of Irish language? What, what can't... Well, what is, it, what is it? Sell to yourselves and others. What is acceptable is what we agreed and what the public agreed in the plebiscite in 1998: support for Irish medium education, support for Irish broadcasting, generous support for an Irish language body and Ulster Scots body, but with the provision that those are demand-led, not demand-required. And secondly, and, and an important point which nationalists conveniently ignore, also written into the agreement was the requirement for language provision to be community sensitive. In other words, the sensitivities of ruling out demands or requirements for Irish language have to include the sensitivities of the other community. Let me go into the audience. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, the Executive or the, the Northern Ireland executive was brought down by Martin McGuinness, who said he collapsed it because of the RHI scandal. The goalposts have now moved by Sinn Féin, saying it's now an Irish language act they're after. Um, there's more people in this country, including the South, who speak Polish. Why is not a Polish? But, I, but, 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 yeah, but I've heard that so many times. But what I'm here tonight <coughs> to ask people like you is what is there about Irish language provisions, protections, be it in an act, be it in legislation, that scares you? Because Why would it not be acceptable to you? Politics of let, me, let, me, let me ask this guy. What, what, we're, we're how held, would it affect your life we're being if held some around. nationalists who wanted that legislation there wouldn't be forced upon you, it would just give them their rights, their freedom, but why, what scares you about that? What why would I, I, but why, what would I, why would I want in Sandy Row Irish language street signs? 
Where would it's I not, want to look for the Three sides were not in the draft agreement. Conor and Gallagher came on the Nolan radio show and they said they wanted every street sign in bit Northern speed. Ireland bilingual. It's bit Pobla bit. then backed that up. Sinn Féin remained silent when it was happening and then made it clear a few days later it was not in the document. It's it was never, not in the, it's never it been. Never in the street document. Signs it may not be in the document council, now, street, but it will be later, street, later on. No, street it's signs are a council matter and they're already dealt with by council. Streets. What does the proposals looked at were trunk signs on roads and that is not in the proposals. The, the, the other, were you happy, sorry Chris, one yeah. second, Linda, were was you happy, happy with what um, was in well, the document? For me, it was a very weak, a very, very weak um, act. It was given nothing, very little to the Irish language. Um, unionism was getting an awful lot more out of it. So as somebody from the unionist community and an Irish speaker, yeah, I was happy enough. I can see that a lot of Irish speakers felt they weren't getting enough, and that's understandable. But I know this is Northern Ireland. People find it difficult to give a little bit. It was going to do no harm whatsoever to unionism. And if you weren't an Irish speaker, it would really have very ben, little impact I, on your life. I was in Dublin this very morning, and I love going down to Dublin. And I, I don't find, have no problem at all with the fact that signage is entirely bilingual. In fact, there was quite a detailed sign that I saw where it was in, at Irish top and English below. Fine. But let's not say that that's a minor thing. That's a huge thing. And that's why they want to do it. The neutral position Sign is to have signed in the draft document. Yes, it wasn't, which, which, which then bring, comes back to what I said about the tactics. When you have people who will bring down a government in the way that they've done and then have rotating demands, naturally people are going to be concerned about what they're going to do. The other thing I'd say is Republicans are very good at using judicial review and very good at using the courts and very good at using vast amounts of British taxpayer money to, to, to fund campaigns. So there, there's, there so are concerns so you're, about so you're, where it you're objecting to what would have come next, not what was in the yeah. document. Can you tell I, me of anything, Ben? You're the, the deputy leader of a unionist newspaper, the deputy editor. Can, can, can you tell me anything that was in the document that you objected to? One of the things that we're going to be looking at in the coming months is what would it mean if Irish is an official language? What does it mean about what was about to be agreed about the courts? I, my own view is this. I think that there's not ever going to be Stormont back with some sort of Irish language provision. It might be that London forces it through or something like that. But the ill will is going to be huge because of the tactics that have been used. It has weaponized it for sure. Can I hear your hand up? Go ahead. White shirt, go ahead. The problem is, Stephen, it's that they are trying to get the Irish to be on par of English, which is nonsense because very few people would even speak it fluently anyway. And the ultimate problem is the end point. It's going to be, say, for example, another year, they'll crash Stormont down, and then they'll be wanting more concessions, they'll be wanting the quotas that everyone's afraid of. And, you know, it's going to just lead to mass discrimination against Protestants and Unis in this country, and it's where completely an unable. But he's right. He's but right. It's not, it's where not, where it's not right. right. It's not right. You see this yeah. idea, and I keep hearing this, that there's going to be discrimination against there will Protestants. be discrimination. I'm a Protestant. There will be discrimination. I work in the Irish Indirect language discrimination. sector. That's a I work fact. with that other is a Protestants fact. who work within the Irish language sector. I actually I speak some Irish, so do you as well. And I have to, to say, there will be indirect discrimination. There will be indirect discrimination. Hold on, hold on, one time. He's speaking to you. Go ahead. Geo Jets, Linda. The point is... Thank you, Shalanta. The point is, it's going to lead to this point where we're, it's basically the unionist identity, unionist culture is being chipped away and Irish is going to be the fait go that they're going to do it. I mean, Jerry Adams even said about using the uh, equality as a Trojan horse, so that, that's ultimately the problem. And it's that end point, and there's a lack of trust from Sinn Féin's intentions. I do not believe that Sinn Féin will be happy if it's Irish. That their own supporters are not happy with what was in that agreement. So they're going to be pushing for an even heavier agreement to bring Storm back. So that's the point. It's concessions, Chris. concessions, concessions. What, what I yeah. keep hearing yeah, yeah. is not an issue with the Irish Language Act. What I keep hearing is an issue with Sinn Féin and the DUP exactly. and how they process things and how they deal with things. Now, I can't argue with that. I want an Irish Language Act, but I don't like how Northern Ireland works and I don't like how the parties work here. Chris? The, the, well, the, the difficulty that we have faced over the talks in the last two years uh, has been that Sinn Féin has used the Irish Language Act as an opportunity to try and, and change and alter and, and, and stultify uh, progress. I mean, 
They had a thing in Stormont called... They say they're representing their own community. They're trying to achieve... They say that, but they say that... They say that... Take, for example, in in, in Stormont, you had a thing called Programme for Government. That was really the... They're what you wanted. Do you know Sinn Féin never once put an Irish Language Act on pro- program, in the programme for government? Up to two years ago, it was never even in their manifestos. They, they produced this thing because I think they, they thought themselves, the prods will go nuts if we try this. This will be a good way to, to disturb the equilibrium within the DUP and give us an opportunity to, to, to get a better deal out of everything. And what, what it concerns me, one of the things I said last night, which you didn't cover, was it said that the damage that they have done to the Irish language with the, the way they've, their shenanigans... In your opinion. In, in my opinion, the damage they've done to the Irish language. The Irish... The, 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 what about uh, the damage people like you do to relationships in this country, to people being able to live together in this country when you're coming out with, I, oh, it's a poke in the eye for prawns? Steve, I, Chris McGems, you didn't I, the executive. 20, 20, 20 years ago, I was going to Irish language schools. You, years, you speak you, Irish, you, right? No, I've, I've, I've spoke a little bit, but I've forgotten it all now. But the point is, I was going to Irish language schools I was speaking to the Irish language people. I, w- I was trying to encourage the unionist and Protestant community that there was no threat from the language. Right, right. now, th- that wasn't getting me many votes in the shankle, but I thought it was the right thing to do. Now, that, that's... That, that, you, you can't do... The, the image of the Irish language now, from the way Sinn Féin have behaved over the last two or three years, lies in tatters in our community. Lies well, in well, tatters. Here's, here's and, the and challenge. Th- that's, 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 well, then, that's the real uh, here, tragedy. Here is the challenge for unionism. The unionism to look at what an Irish Language Act could contain, an Irish Language Act that will unite us with Scotland, with the Isle of Man, with other parts of the UK, that will strengthen the linguistic links between these islands, because that's what the Gaelic language does. So why doesn't unionists sit down and say, here's an act that's acceptable to us, that we don't feel Well, because you have the leading unionist party cost. saying out loud, we will never accept an Irish Language Act, but, while at the same time, the same they were time clearly in negotiations, yeah, exactly. dealing so, with things that wouldn't be in an Irish Language Act, but would be in an Irish so Language well, some, them, some, 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 some of the DUP vehicle, take some, it some out of, of Sinn Féin's hands take it out of Sinn Féin's hands and let unionists okay. let me come over here it. and then David y- y- yes go ahead second row um, I'd like to come back to a point that was mentioned earlier by uh, the Irish language holding unionism hostage it seems more like it's the DUP arrogance that's demonising the language it's a simple language that anybody can take up to learn why can Scottish and Welsh have their language act, but Irish can't. Well, David? I think we need to take a lesson from our recent history. The Irish language provisions were enacted in the Irish Republic or in the Irish Free State in the 1930s, specifically to de-Britishify the remains of the Protestant British community in the Free State. In 1921, the Protestant population was 11%. Do you know what it is less than 100 years later? Less than two percent. That's not the blame. They don't even the have language. the Irish language act in the, in, the, the Welsh, in the Irish constitution was to de, was did to the deprive Gaelic Protestant yes. Irish but men David, and women David, from jobs. Did they, the they, Welsh they had act to leave? Did, they had to did, leave. And sorry. you ask Stephen. Did, they, it, you ask why? Hold on, hold on, Stephen. Sorry, did, hold on. Let's not have a sideshow conversation. I think that's well recognised. You ask why we are concerned about the impact of this act. You ask the Protestants that came up from Northern Ireland because they had to leave the Republic because of the implications of an Irish language act there. It's called David, ethnic cleansing. I meet the, Protestants oh, on, in the David. South who speak on, Irish. 12% come on, to two, on, less than 2%. Come on, not that type of language that does nothing for modern day Northern Ireland. There is no ethnic cleansing or anything close to it. In Northern Ireland, David? Uh, not in Northern Ireland. Cultural cleansing. I'm talking about the Irish Free State. And I would use the benefit of your programme tonight to call on the Irish government to institution a, institute a national inquiry into the treatment of the Protestant population from 1921. That, that, will, that, will, that so will give you... If we, look, if we do not learn lessons from our history... David. If we do not learn lessons from our history, we're doomed to repeat them. Uh, front row here, very front row. Go ahead, sir. I, I think what we're trying to do here through the Irish Language Act is actually to uh, redress a historic injustice. The reason why everybody on the island of Ireland, or 90% or more, 
speak English is because Ireland was military occupied. The North was partially colonised, and if you take Canada or Australia or America, this is history or we're New talking Zealand, about here. Can we not talk even, about now even, and what we're going to do in the future? What we're, future. Trying, what we're trying to do, what people are trying to do through the Irish Language Act, is to redress this historic injustice. There's no reason why the Irish language shouldn't be treated exactly the same on a par with the English but language. It wasn't it, two years ago, it was an issue for Sinn Féin. Now it's such a big issue. You can't fix your potholes. Your children can't have. Can't have, have, have operations. See, you can't that, fix I, I, okay. I believe. I believe. I believe that's nonsense. I believe that's nonsense because if you bring Stormont back tomorrow, they'll just bring in more Tory austerity. Having Stormont right. will fix problems. Young fellow here. Yes, go ahead. Stephen, address the at us. the back. Third row from the back. Stephen, see this side, our side, their side. That's the reason why this country isn't moving forward. The the um. They keep bringing these things up on both sides. You know, I think Stormont needs fresh faces, you know, with the likes of Michelle and Arlene in it. Um, they're both strong. They're stuck in their ways. Have they you, they have can't come to compromise. Have you any knowledge around these rumours that some members of the, the DUP briefed uh, loyalist uh, leaders uh, in Northern Ireland <laughs> about to, the act on the Sunday? You need to take that up to the DUP. Well, Arlene Foster has said if it did happen... It, it, it wasn't uh, in her name. Have you any knowledge if it did or didn't happen? Well, Stephen, as you well know, I'm in the National Union of Journalists, so if anybody spoke to me, I couldn't reveal my sources, so uh, don't take that either way. So whatever, you take, take whatever you want out of that. But I'm not asking you to reveal your sources. I'm asking you, you have you any knowledge. Me, if, well, I, if, know, I if, know what you're asking me. You're essentially asking me, did anybody speak to me? I'm asking or you do any I know did anybody, if anybody speak to any the GP talk, spoke to any well, loyalist leaders? Let, and don't, don't take anything out of this, but let, let me nail this point, because I seen last night Declan Kearney, who uh, he set himself up, he's almost like Gandhi sometimes, complained about if the DUP consulted or spoke to loyalists. And I'm not saying they did or they didn't, but if they did, we are in the height of absurdity when we have Sinn Féin, who a government report in 2015 says are continued to take the action of an illegal terrorist organisation, namely the IRA. Again, you're, has you're the going cheek, back. Has, no, no, this was last night. Declan Kearney said this. Has the cheek to criticise the DUP if they spoke to loyalists? And at the end of the day, there's no evidence that they did Could speak they to loyalists. And even if they did, even if they did, here we have a situation where the DUP mm. would have spoken to people within their constituency. Where do you think loyalists live? On the moon?